can you record from your phone there? You got that too? Uh, yeah, I got them both going. So we're ready to go. All right. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our um, our live event that we have going on. It's uh, we are really excited to be talking with our polar researcher Elizabeth Webb, who hopefully you can see her face right now. She's going to be talking to us from Healy, Alaska. Hi, Elizabeth. And uh, I kind of like the video thing. We may have to do this more often. Um, today is Thursday, March 29th, 2012, and we're doing this event as part of our uh, online course. So we have a number of students that are joining us, as well as other educators and a few scientists I see lurking there as well. So um, a few things about the uh, platform that we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate, and um, we, this is probably our, I don't know, maybe our fifth or so event that we've done on these, this platform. So there's some new things that we're trying out here today for this class. But the content should be showing up in the center of your screen. Um, and, and hopefully, if you have a good connection, it should change fairly frequently. There's a chat box um, on the, somewhere on the left hand side of your screen. You can move that around if you want to. Um, there's also a list of participants, and one of the features that we use there is the little hand icon above the list of participants. If you click on that, that lets us know you want to ask your question live. Um, you can also type in your questions in the chat room, and Elizabeth um, will be able to see them as we go along. Um, what else? You can also um, use emoticons to clap or give a thumbs up, whatever you want. If you are participating by phone, which I don't think anybody else is except for Sarah and myself, you would mute it by dialing a star 6 to mute and star 6 to unmute. Um, when it comes time to ask questions and you want to ask them live, a few of you have practiced your voice over IP, but you would click on the talk button uh, once and that opens your mic. Click on it a second time when you're done talking, and that closes your mic. Do not leave your mics open, otherwise we'll get a lot of feedback, and it can be very annoying. Um, you, we are trying out the video today uh, with Elizabeth, and this may come or go depending on your bandwidth, as well as Elizabeth. She is talking from a, um, a smaller community in Alaska, so we'll see how that goes. Um, if it annoys you or you get tired of that, you can minimize that screen as well. So um, I think that's it for the platform. So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to give you all a chance to um, introduce yourselves to the group. Um, we're going to do participant introductions. So I will go back down that list of participants. I'll call on you, and when I do, um, try to speak uh, clearly into the, your mics. Again, if you're talking with Voice over IP, click the talk button once to open it. Click it again to, when you're done uh, to close it. So um, we'll start with Allison Webb. Um, you didn't test out. Go ahead. We aren't hearing you, Allison. So can you tell us where you are and who you are? All right. Allison's microphone is not working for us at the moment. So Allison, I uh, disabled you. You get your mic back here. Can you t type in there in the chat room and tell us who you are and where you're and uh, and where you're from? And we'll go to Bruce. Hi, this is Bruce. Uh, I am in Ma uh, Madison, New Jersey, right now. I am an environmental science teacher at Mendham High School, and um, I teach um, environmental science, another course called Environmental Issues. I teach AP, and uh, I was also in this course in the fall. I really enjoyed it. I thought the webinars were really cool, and that's why I signed up for this again. Anything else you want me to mention? Uh, no, that's perfect. Okay, Thank thanks. You. All right, and uh, we're going to go to uh, Callie. Go ahead, Callie. Maybe, and I might be missing this. If Callie, if you don't have a microphone, it looks like you're chatting. So uh, go ahead. That's fine. Um, 
We're going to move on to Elliot. Hi, I'm Elliot Friedman. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering at Cornell. Um, and I'll be giving the other webinar next week. Okay, thanks. Welcome, Elliot. Okay, uh, Janine. Hi, I'm Janine. I'm a high school science teacher. I teach anatomy, uh, zoology, and botany, and probably in the next year or two in, in environmental science. So I'm just looking forward to being here. Welcome. Uh, Julia. Yeah, I'm Julia. I work, I teach for Oak Meadow School, which is a distance learning school. They, we are based in Brattleboro, Vermont. However, I live in the um, Adirondack Mountains of New York. So I teach high school science, um, environmental science, biology, uh, health and fitness, and some chemistry. So uh, if we do ever get students in uh, participating, they will be sort of on their own and not in a classroom situation because they're all over the world. OK, thanks. Oh, very cool. All right, welcome. Uh, Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Barker. I'm a science teacher in Boulder, Colorado. And um, I'm currently there, but we'll be heading up to Alaska as a polar truck teacher in a month or so, a little more than a month, um, to Tulik Field Station to do some work up there with nutrient cycling in the tundra. OK, great. Welcome aboard here. And um, I saw some chat. Um, I don't know if Sue, Natalie, he looks like you don't. You might have a microphone. Maybe. <laughs> I think she's testing her audio. I think that's what that symbol is there. Yeah, it keeps bouncing around. OK, well, Sue um, can introduce herself, but she's the researcher that uh, um, John Wood and Elizabeth are, are uh, um, they're working for her research project. So we'll let her chat in the chat feature and tell us who she is a little bit more in depth. For Elizabeth okay, will introduce her as well. Yeah, she might be ready. Do you want to test out your mic? Okay. And move on to uh, Susan Steiner, that is. Maybe not. Okay. So, how about Suzanne? Sue Zobel, a middle school science teacher in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. Um, and I've been a little bit up in the tundra, love the area, and looking forward to learning more. Great, great. And then we have another group that's just lurking there, UT they and Venture Learning. Oh, I think they've introduced themselves and why they're um, Maybe they can tell us why they're lurkers today. Um, Uta, go ahead, Uta, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Uta, and uh, I work at the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. So uh, I will make sure that your grades are posted and. Uh, Work with the OICOS people on the course design and content. And um, I was also a former Polar Trek teacher. You can find a lot of my stories on the internet on the Polar Trek website. And so, welcome everybody, and I hope uh, you enjoy the course. Great, thank you, Lita. Okay, so we're going to move on to just a little bit of background about why we um, are doing this. This is all part of the Polar Trek program. And um, Polar Trek is um, what John Wood and some others have mentioned that they're participating in. So if you're new to this, um, Polar Trek, we place uh, teachers with researchers out in the field. And one of the things that uh, um, teachers and researchers do is outreach activities, is um, do these live events. Um, this particular live event in conjunction with an online course that we offer, the Sea Ice course, uh, Cyber, I don't know, maybe uh, Uta can type up what Sea Ice means. I forgot already. 
interdisciplinary cyber based interdisciplinary science educators course. That's it. And um, we host this class uh, three times a year with the, in conjunction with the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. And Uta is our instructor that helps us um, make sure that everyone gets their grades and um, and helps teach the course. So um, we're glad that the number of students are able to join us as well as other educators. So with that, I think we're ready to go to um, we're going to turn this over to Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, jump to your first slide and we will follow along. Oh, sorry. Actually, Elizabeth, before um, you get too far along, we forgot about John Wood because he wasn't signed on. So if John wants to introduce himself, and then we will go to you. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> Let me talk. They're going to see you. Okay. Well, hello. I'm uh, I'm here with Elizabeth, and I'm John Wood. I'm uh, living and working up here in Healy, Alaska, as part of Sue Natalie's project. And this is my second season up here. We're looking at uh, carbon balance in the tundra and uh, uh, having a good time at this point. All right. Nice silhouette there, John. We didn't get to really see your face, so maybe at some time you can move in behind Elizabeth. <laughs> but that's all right. So, okay, we're going to turn this over to Elizabeth, and uh, you can go to your slides. All right, are you ready to go? Sure are. Sure right. are. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Webb, and I'll be talking about carbon balance in a warming tundra today. Um, I also want to thank Sue Natale and Ted Schur. I've been working for this project for about a year, but Sue and Ted have been from the, uh, with the project since its inception about four years ago, and um, this is really their brainchild. So thank you to them. Oh. Hold on, I'm trying to figure out how to shift slides. Just a sec. All right. Um, so first off, why should we study climate change in high latitudes? Well, these areas have experienced the greatest regional warming on Earth. So we have seen two to three degrees uh, Celsius temperature increases in these areas since 1950. And that's more warming than we've seen in any other uh, region of the world. Um, so and these changes are slated to continue. So we expect to see higher um, regional warming in the Arctic and the Antarctic as compared to the rest of um, regions on Earth. And then there is also a large potential for positive feedback in the Arctic e ecosystems. So you may have heard about sea ice and how melting sea ice can change the albedo and the amount of radiation the oceans can absorb. So that's one way that, uh, that the Arctic will experience a positive feedback. But today we're going to be talking about um, ca carbon in the permafrost and how that might become a positive feedback or not to climate change. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry, just a sec. The, but having my face up here is really distracting, so I'm trying to figure out how to minimize it. Okay, there we go. Um, so just a little bit of background on permafrost. Permafrost is permanently frozen ground that's been frozen for three or more years. And that can refer to uh, rocks or pebbles or anything that's in, um, in the ground. But mostly when we refer to permafrost, we're referring to the organic material in the permafrost the permafrost soils. Above the permafrost is the active layer, and that's the layer that seasonally thaws. And so it'll freeze during the winter and then gradually thaw out during the summer. In our area, the maximum thaw depth is about 50 or so centimeters. So it's not that much, the active layer. But it is important for life in permafrost areas. Um, it's how plants can put down their roots and access the water table, as well as other nutrients. Historically, tundra ecosystems have been a carbon sink. And that means they're taking in more carbon than they're letting out. And we want to know, how will this change with warming? So plants take in carbon um, through photosynthesis. That's how carbon comes into the tundra. And then it's released through plant respiration and soil, micro, soil microbe respiration back to the atmosphere. 
Um, and <laughs> sorry, I'm so distracted by this chat. Okay, paying attention. Um, so we've got about two times as much carbon in permafrost soils as in the atmosphere. The way this happens is over thousands and thousands of years, we have plants that are taking in carbon and then dying, and that organic material stays in the soil. But because it's so cold and the conditions up here are so harsh, um, soil microbes don't have a chance to respire that carbon back to the atmosphere before winter comes. And so you've got layers upon layers of built up carbon in the permafrost. In fact, you, if you go down deep enough, you can see entire willow roots or mammoth tusks that are um, tens of thousands of years old, just stored, pretty much preserved in the permafrost. Uh, around Healy, um, if you go about 80 centimeters, which is the largest depth that we've sampled, the permafrost carbon is about 10,000 years old. So we've got a lot of carbon and a lot of really old carbon um, in this area. So one thing that we're worried about with warming is what happens if the permafrost thaws. You've got this active layer, so that's the seasonally thawed layer that has a lot of available carbon for microbes to respire. If that active layer deepens and then we have more available carbon, we're worried that that carbon will be lost to the atmosphere. And that's really what we're studying, and, um, how, what are the dynamics of this, and um, how will this change with warming. The overarching question of our lab is, what is the annual carbon balance of a warmed tundra? In order to answer this, we've set up a warming experiment called Carbon in Permafrost Experimental Heating Research. We call it CYPER. Um, and that's in Healy, Alaska. So our field site is in interior Alaska, as you can see from the map on the upper left-hand corner. We're at 60 degrees north, and we're right off the Parks Highway, which is the road that goes from Anchorage to Fairbanks. Um, we're about four hours north of Anchorage and two hours south of Fairbanks. We're on the north slope of the Alaska Range, and in this picture of our field site, you can actually see the um, northern mountains of the Alaska Range. We're in the discontinuous permafrost zone. So that means that the area that our field site is on is completely permafrost. But if you went, say, 30 miles north of Healy, there might be an area that has no permafrost. And then further, than, further north than that, permafrost. A little bit further north than that, no permafrost. And eventually you get to an area that is the continuous permafrost zone, and then you'll have permafrost continuous from there all the way to the Arctic Ocean. So our site is completely permafrost, um, but it's in the discontinuous permafrost zone. And then we're in an area of tussock tundra. So what does the tundra look like? I know before I came up here, I thought of the tundra as a really barren landscape. And in the winter, sometimes it feels like that. But in the summer, it's really alive and um, not barren at all. The tussock forming plant that we have is pictured here on the right. It's the um, Ariophorum vaginatum. And then we also have some mosses in the wetter areas and Labrador tea blueberries, and um, bog cranberries, among other things, um, during the summer. Why Healy? Healy is at the southern extent of the permafrost zone, which is really important for when we're studying change, because we think that change here might be an indicator of what will happen further north. So if we can understand what's happening on the southern extent of the permafrost zone, and then we could see it happen, we might be able to figure out what will happen at more northern areas. We've also had ongoing permafrost borehole measurements here. A group from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks has been me measuring the temperature of the permafrost here since the early 80s. 
And as you can see from the graph on the right, temperatures have been increasing over the past 20 to 30 years, especially at 10 meters. And another thing to note about this graph is the temperature. We're at about negative 0.7, negative 0.8, depending on the year, um, degrees Celsius. This is really close to zero, all things considered. Further up north, you might get temperatures that are, let's say, negative 1, negative 5, negative 8 degrees Celsius. But we're really on the brink of change. If we have the type of warming that we've had in the past 20 to 30 years, again, in the future, we might be on that, um, we might be in an area that's uh, thawed. So again, another reason that we really want to study change here is because change could happen um, in the next several decades, and that could be an indicator for what could happen further north. So we set up a warming experiment here at Healy. It warms in two different ways. The first is through winter warming. So we have um, fences set up, and in the winter, the wind comes predominantly from the southern, from the south, and the winds come and are slowed down by the fence, and then snow preferen de preferentially deposits on the north side of the fence. And this picture that you're looking at on the left is from the north side of the fence. So we get these mounds of snow that form. Snow acts as an insulator, so it insulates the, the soil, and we have warming of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius on average. This is soil warming. Then we also warm the air in the summer using greenhouse chambers, and those warm the air about 1 degree Celsius during the midday. Then we sort of have a mismatch of um, different warming treatments. We have total control, where we want to see what happens without any treatment, without any warming. We've got summer warming only, winter warming only, and annual warming. So that's both summer and winter warming. Another important part of our experimental design is snow shoveling, which is going to happen here in Healy in a couple of weeks. So if anyone is interested in shoveling in Alaska, we might have a job for you. Um, but uh, the reason we do this is because we're not trying to study the impacts of increased precipitation. Precipitation models in general um, are not quite as good as temperature models, and we don't really know what's going to happen in this area with warming in terms of precipitation. So we're not trying to study that. Um, so we need to shovel out the snow right before meltout, because otherwise this increased snow would uh, delay meltout in our warmed plots, which we don't want. And it might also increase soil moisture, which is something we also don't want. So we spend a week or so shoveling out the snow to the same level as on the other side of the fence, on the control side. So um, when meltdown occurs, it will happen the same on both sides of the fence. During the growing season, we're trying to figure out this balance between plants taking in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and respiration and decomposition, what CO2 lost to the atmosphere. As I said earlier, historically, the tundra has been a carbon sink, meaning it's taken in more CO2 than it's let out. And we want to know how is this going to change with warming. So to measure this during the growing season, we measure CO2 flux from automated chambers. So we have these open top chambers, and there's free exchange with the air during the day with these chambers. Then when it's time to sample, the chambers close, and we sample CO2 concentration in the chambers. And this happens at each site about one every hour and a half, every plot every hour and a half. And so over the course of the season, we have about 50,000 flux measurements. We also measure precipitation, air pressure, air temperature, soil temperature, and photosynthetically active radiation. 
so that we can know the physical parameters that determine, or some of the p physical parameters that determine CO2 flux. During the growing season, plants take up CO2, and so our graphs look like this one on the left, where CO2 con concentration decreases with time uh, during the day as plants are taking in CO2. And during the night, when plants are not photosynthesizing, but they're still respiring and microbes are respiring, CO2 concentration increases with time. Um, so this is a slide of some of the results of the study. It's growing season net ecosystem exchange. So this is the net amount of carbon coming into Cyper, into our plots. There are a lot of things to look at and consider in this graph. Um, so first, let's look at ambient. So ambient is our total control. We have no treatments on these plots. So our ambient is increasing the amount of CO2 coming in. So it's becoming more of a sink over time. Now, three years is not long enough to, to have any sort of trend, and we're not trying to say, um, we're not trying to um, draw any conclusions from this. However, it is consistent with other studies which have shown a greening of the tundra over time. If we look at 2009, 2009 was a dry year, which is why it's particularly low. And also, um, if you look at 2009, the error bars on, e on each of these are pretty large, which means that for all intents and purposes, they're not, it's not necessarily um, statistically significant. These are all about the same. So we want to focus on 2011. 2011 is particularly important because at this time, our experiment has been running for three years. So we've warmed the winter soils for three years. And during the summer, it's been warm for three years. So the plants, this was not just an anomalous, anomalous, anomalously <laughs> warm year. Um, the, the plants have sort of gotten used to, and the treatment has really started to sink in. So what we see with these treatments is that the winter warming plots are taking in more carbon than the ambient plots, than the control plots, as are the summer warming plots. So what we see here is that warming actually increased the amount of carbon that our plots are taking in, um, which is really pretty huge and important for the planet. Um, so where is all of this carbon going? Um, we measure uh, and track when our plots leaf out and when they die. So we noticed that warming advanced bud break and delayed senescence. And senescence just means um, when, when they die at the end of the season. So that's one way that the plants are allocating their resources differently uh, in these warmer slides. Um, in these warmer treatments. Warming also increased flower and fruit production. And again, this is something that we um, had been measuring uh, for every year that this is going on. And we see that in the warming plots, um, flower and fruit production you know, was heightened. Um, and then there's the question of what's going on in the winter. So the tundra plants are not photosynthesizing in the winter. Um, uh, they're covered with snow for one, and also it's really cold. Uh, but soil microbes are still decomposing and respiring, which is pretty amazing. And they can actually do this in sub-freezing temperatures. So our question is, how is the amount of CO2 released from the tundra in the winter going to change um, with warming? As I mentioned earlier, we've seen a 2 to 3 degrees temperature increase since the early 1950s in the Arctic. So that's this graph on the left. Um, annual 
um, increases again two to three degrees temperature. And that uh, star is roughly where we're located uh, in interior Alaska. In the winter, however, uh, warming is, is greater than the annual. We've observed a four degrees increase, uh, degrees Celsius increase in the winter since the early 1950s. And this temperature increase is expected to continue to be larger than the annual um, in years to come. So the winter will sort of bear the brunt of a lot of the temperature increases expected in the Arctic. So we are also out here measuring winter flux measure, taking winter flux, flux measurements. We have collars that are permanently in the ground that we put a, put a, a chamber on um, and measure CO2 flux, which in the early season is quite, are quite easy to dig out and a little bit more difficult here now that we're in the late winter season. Um, and then, as you can see from the graph to the right, CO2 concentration increases over time. And again, this is pretty amazing that the microbes are still respiring here in the winter. Um, we also collect soil temperature, air temperature, snow depth, and air pressure. And one reason for this is uh, it's pretty harsh conditions here in the winter, and things don't always work quite as well as you would like. So what we're trying to see is how are these physical, how do these physical parameters um, change the C or dictate what the CO2 flux is, and can we model that? And if so, then our measurements might be uh, we might be able to have a better idea of what's going on on an annual basis. We also measure CO2 um, flux during the winter through permanent chambers that we keep on our con on our plots. So we have them on the control side as well as on the warming side. Now, these are just preliminary results. Um, modeled results suggest a 70% increase um, of CO2 released from experimental warming plots. That's from the control plots. And some of our data suggest a 300% increase from CO2 released from experimental warming as opposed to control plots. And again, this is just preliminary data. But we do see a huge, a huge amount of carbon leaving the tundra in the winter from the warming plots in comparison with the control. So conclusions. Um, during the growth, growing season, you have increased plant uptake. Um, so you have more CO2 going into the tundra. You also have increased respiration and decomposition, but not as much as plant uptake. So in all, you have a carbon sink during the summer or during the growing season. And this is even more of a carbon sink than, um, than in the control plots. During the winter, you have increased respiration um, due, due to warming, which is a carbon source. Now, the winter is always a carbon source. However, that's heightened and more so uh, in a warmed tundra, in our warmed plots, than in a non-warmed plot. So, of course, the question is, what's happening on an annual basis? Well, it's a carbon sink during the summer and a carbon source during the winter. If we see that 70% increase that I was talking about in terms of modeled CO2 increase, then we'll see just about the same amount of carbon entering and leaving the tundra. If we have a carbon sink during the summer, and a carbon source during the winter with a 300% increase. And again, this is just preliminary results, so we're not ready to say what's happening yet. Then this would be a net carbon source. Um, so this work that we're doing right now in the winter is really important to what's happening on the tundra on an annual basis. Uh, I would like to thank um, Peter Ganslin, Sue Natale, Ted Scher, and John Wood for their help with this. 
and I'm sure that there are some questions because I can see that people have been chatting, but I have been trying to ignore you so that I can concentrate. So that yeah. 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 Okay. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth. So. We did have a lot of questions that came up. Sue has been trying to respond to them as fast as she can, and that was a great presentation, by the way. So if you do have a question, you want to ask it live now, um, and I'm sure some of you would like to, just click on the little hand icon above the list of participants so that we can uh, call on you. Um, and it, for those of you that don't have a mic, just keep typing them away in the chat area. Um, Let's see. So there was um, a question from. Okay, so what, let's go to Bruce. Brucey, go ahead. Now, the question is: It seems like there's a big range of what could happen, whether it's seventy percent or three hundred percent. And I'm just wondering where you're going to go with this. You're going to try to quantify um, what what the difference is and what this is going to mean over time, and build this into models as as warming takes place and try to figure out what the overall net effect on climate is going to be? Uh, yes, that is absolutely what we hope. I guess just during the short term, we are trying to figure out what's happening at Healy and try and get a better understanding uh, of, of what's happening right here. Um, in terms of building into larger global climate models, Obviously, we would hope that that would be a part of it. And actually, Sue, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that the permafrost models are really taken into, or sorry, what's happening with the permafrost is really take that much taken into account right now uh, with uh, climate models. So um, uh, yeah, so which is one reason that they are that they had set so um, under. Um, was under projected what might happen. Okay. Um, Sue, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or if your mic is working. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I have my phone. I lost the video, but that's okay. I don't need it anymore. Um, yeah, so I, I, I missed. Um, just a little bit of it when I was trying to get this out. Um, yeah, but this information hopefully will be joined up um, with climate models, and I'll give a plug for the um, Permafrost Research Coordination Network, which is a group that Headshore got together to get people who are working in the field doing these type of experiments to put this sort of information into the climate models. And I think Elizabeth had said that a lot of um, permafrost feedbacks currently are not in those models. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, I think the biggest unknown still is these winter numbers. As Elizabeth showed you, we have this huge range of 70 to 300 percent increase. Um, I'll say 300 percent are numbers that Elizabeth's getting from her measurement. 70 percent is what I'm getting from models. But my model only includes temperature differences. It doesn't include changes in the microbial community. And that may be some of the stuff that she's getting with her measurements. Um, and the reason we have this huge range is because it's really hard to take these measurements. Um, so that's what Elizabeth's going to be working on, you know, this winter and next winter, and hopefully she'll refine these numbers a little bit until um, so we can get a better answer. Because that that's a huge range, and it's going to shift what what we think about what's going to happen um, with the carbon numbers with these permafrost ecosystems. Sue, is, is it? Um Biology.ufl.edu permafrost carbon. Is that you? Um, say that again. Is that the network that you're talking about, the permafrost carbon network? At UFL? Yes. Okay. Yes. I put the link here for everybody. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay, great. Thanks. We yeah, I see that you disappeared off of our uh, little world here. So <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'm gonna try to get back on. <laughs> okay, no problems. Okay, um, the next question comes from uh, Julia, so we'll let Julia ask her question. Go ahead. Hey, I have uh, just a, two questions. Actually, one is related to the one that um, Sue responded to on the chat. Um, 
I just want to get the terminology right. You say the CO2 uptake is more in the winter, but isn't it, you know, um, the winter is more of a CO2 source because of the microbial activity and no uptake? I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry, yes, perhaps I misspoke. The, during the winter, uh, the tundra is releasing CO2, not taking it in. So yes, during the winter, it is a source. Awesome. Okay, I just want to clarify that. And the other question is I, about the past 50 years where you say um, it's, there's been a 2 to 3 degree increase in temperature, are you uh, looking back in time to see, project backwards to see how far we've come so far? Uh, no, mostly our experiments here are dealing with what, um, what will happen with future warming. Uh, we've got, the work that's sort of done backwards is more just we're aging the carbon and so instead of going backwards 50 years, we're going backwards more um, thousands and thousands of years. Uh, just to see what age carbon is being released from the tundra. Thank you. And can I add something? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one thing that's confusing about this experiment is that there's the winter warming treatment, and then there's sort of respiration during the winter time. So that winter warming treatment, which warm the soils during the winter time has a carryover effect during the growing season where it increases the depth of, of the amount of ground that's thawed. And that's why we're seeing this increased uptake with the winter warming treatment but during the growing season. So, and I think I may have taped something that was confusing, which is why I want to clarify. So we have the winter warming treatment that's sort of soil warming plus increased thaw depth. It increases carbon uptake during the growing season, but then it also has this effect that it's increasing um, the amount of carbon that's being lost from the ecosystem to the atmosphere during the winter time. Does that make sense now? Yeah, so they, uh, that did clarify that too. Okay, great. So there was a question earlier from Allison who doesn't have a mic and she wanted to know how many years of data will you have to analyze by the end of the project? Uh, that, I don't know. <laughs> that's actually um, a good question because this is, of course, all funded through grants, which have a three to five year, most of the time, lifespan. Um, and actually, I think Sue might know more about that than me. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. There. So, okay, so the first plant was for three. The three years now, and then it just um, got the funding just got extended, and I don't know if it's for three or five years. Um, so we'll at least have six years, I'd say, and hopefully more. Which is important because um, you know one thing I always think about with this experiment is that we're we're taking our temperatures to replicate what's going to happen say 50 years from now, but the plant community has this lag where in order for the plant community to shift, it's going to take decades for that to happen. So hopefully that this will continue to be funded so we can get the long-term data. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, we can see in the slide that I just pulled up that in 2011 where you have, where we have a longer period of treatment, we're getting different numbers. And so hopefully if we can continue that over longer, we can understand what would happen on a longer time scale than just three years. <laughs> OK. Uh, are there any other uh, questions out there? Anybody want to ask a question? What about this? slide you have up right now, um, the, the sink, it, it looks to me like there's a net carbon sink. Am I, I'm just trying to read this slide correctly because there's very little in the lower part. If you could just clarify that. Yeah, so, so I guess what this, uh, what this slide is showing is that 
with our treatments, so with our winter warming treatment and our summer warming treatment, um, the, uh, the tundra is actually taking in more carbon than the, um, than the control slash ambient plots. Um, does that answer your question? Was there more that you were looking for? I was um, looking for that net zero um, over the winter, the annual net, which is approximately zero and will, uh, I guess, go down. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm asking. Okay, so I, I think so. This, this graph is just during the growing season because we sort of set it up as we're doing winter measurements and we're doing growing season measurements. And this graph is only growing season um, measurements. And I think what you're asking for is looking at this on an annual basis. And that's not something that we're, you know, it's something we're still working on. So we don't have a nice pretty graph like this yet uh, for, for the annual basis. Um, but Yes, if, you, if we had the 70% um, warming, which is what Sue's models are suggesting, then, the, then on an annual basis, it would be pretty close to zero. And if we had this 300% increase, which is what some of the field data are showing, then you would have, then it would be negative and it would be a source on an annual basis. Right now, know? we are looking at a, um, uh, it's a carbon sink at the moment, correct? It, during the, uh, <laughs> yes, I guess during the growing season. Um, yeah, and historically it has been, I don't know if we've done, I guess, yeah, historically it has been um, a sink, and right now, I guess, we don't have we lost you Elizabeth. Okay. Oh, I think I pressed the talk button at the wrong time. I'm sorry. Um the uh so I guess right now, yes, the tundra is a sink, it's taking in it's taking in more CO2, um, but we're going to have to spend more time looking at those winter data because, again, the winter data is just something new that we have started to look at and study. Okay, um, we have a uh, comment or a question from Elliot, so go ahead, Elliot. Well, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any idea how quickly the soil becomes anaerobic there, and um, I guess whether You've been uh, considering changes in that as they pertain to soil respiration. Uh, I, again, I guess I should ask Sue about this. Um, if you are thinking about methane production, we have done, or we did a little bit of methane testing last year. And in general, those results were pretty uninteresting and pretty close to zero, um, which yeah, um, we are thinking about now sort of changing our sampling regime to testing during periods of time, what, like right after rains, um, so that we can uh, get a better idea of what's happening on that sort of temporal scale, r rain, lock, wet, or dry. Um, I guess just for background for everyone else, and I think that this is what you're asking, um, Elliot, is that when you have, if you have really wet conditions and you often will have methane production from the soil, and that's one of the worries uh, that thawing permafrost, people are worried about methane loss from thawing permafrost. And I guess down here in Healy, we haven't seen that quite as very much. Um, but that's something that we're thinking about changing our sampling regime to reflect. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I was uh, just curious because I know in Barrow things are pretty uh, pretty wet and anaerobic very quickly, but it looks like uh, maybe once the thaw happens, things kind of dry out up there.
Okay, great. Um, there was a question that came up um, in the chat, and uh, this one will be for Elizabeth and John, I guess. Um, so they wanted to know, Uta, trick question from her. Are you working with the Healy K through 12 students? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, I guess the short answer is we we worked with them last year. Do you, <laughs> yeah. So we worked with them last year. They came out to the field site for a day, and that was really fun. And um, then we ha are sort of still in the process of contacting them this year. Yeah, uh, we had a really good experience last season with the Tri Valley School and their uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders coming out. Uh, and this year. Uh, Timing wise, we we they just coming back from their spring break, so we're still trying to get those connections uh, and timing down at this point. Okay. Um, and uh, Melissa has a question for you. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, I'm wondering. I've read a little bit about um, sort of the initial increase in growth that you see with plants with increased CO2. And I'm wondering if you, there's any literature that you guys have been looking at um, that you know you could apply to what you're doing. Obviously, you only have a few years of data, um, and hopefully, we'll have some more. But um, to think about, so you know, I'm looking at your slide, that, or I'm thinking about the slide that talks about you know it kind of being about even because there's an increase in growth and then an increase in respiration. Well. Is there a point in time that we can see from other literature that where that um, increase in growth is going to decrease? So the photosynthetic, photosynthetic rate is going to decrease, and then are we going to be really concerned about um, the CO2 um, being released in much higher percentage or amounts? Yeah, I would echo those concerns. I'm not too familiar with that literature, but if Sue is still around, I'm sure she can answer that question. Sue, are you there? Yes. yes. I'm so sorry. I'm in and out. Can you repeat the question really quick, please? Yeah. So Sue, she was just wondering, like. Is there some sort of um, limit that we might approach with CO2 where, or, sorry, with photosynthesis, photosynthesis where, um, that may, and, and what's the literature, I guess, on this in, in, in other areas where the tundra might c continue to let out CO2 through respiration, but the, uh, perhaps at some point at a higher rate than, than um, plants are taking it in through photosynthesis. So she was sort of, you know, like, are we going to reach a leveling off point for for photosynthetic productivity? Um, and so she was wondering if you had uh, read any literature on that. Okay, that's a good question. I have to get the numbers. So, okay, if we just think of it staying as a tundra, when we look at natural areas that are naturally that are undergoing like permafrost de degradation, the trajectory is that at first you get a little bit of permafrost thaw, and you start to see a net uptake of carbon because the plant productivity increases and it's happening um, at a rate, I guess, is faster than microbial losses. But as you get more extensive amount of thaws, then we start to see this net loss. So the the now that's saying that this is staying as a tundra. If we think that, okay, perhaps the system will shift to a boreal system, how much of that carbon can be stored then, say, and you're going to have a lot of more above ground carbon um, in a boreal system. Those numbers still are a lot less than the total amount of carbon that's stored in permafrost soils. But I don't have an answer right now for how much, like, what is the percentage of that carbon that's stored currently in permafrost that's going to be lost? If all that carbon was lost, there's no chance that that amount of carbon can be maintained in, in biomass. Um, even 10% couldn't even be maintained because there's so much carbon stored there. So um, it's I, I guess I feel like it's unlikely, but I don't have the numbers right now. But I will say staying, if we continue this tundra, um, the trajectory is likely that this plant increased productivity is not going to be able to keep up with the losses from the soil.
Okay. Thanks. So do we have any other questions that came up? Okay. So Julia wants to know why the net loss after a while more aerobic decomposition? Question mark. I'm not sure I understand that question. Could you repeat it? I'll just say uh, it. Julia, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I can say it. Um, you mentioned the um, there's a net the beginning of the thawing, a net carbon uptake, which makes sense, increased plant activity, um, more thawing, uh, net loss of carbon, and I'm assuming that's because of the more um, respiration going on with decomposition. Yeah, I mean that's that's what we're seeing with Elizabeth at the at the thaw gradient that we in in an, we have adjacent to this warming stream we have um, a naturally a permafrost thaw gradient so areas with minimal amount of thaw and then an area with a moderate amount of thaw an area with extensive thaw and we, you know in the moderate area the net is this uptake because the plants. Are taking up more carbon. We're getting a shift to these larger shrubs, but yeah, as the ground starts to thaw more, all of a sudden you have this very large pool of carbon now available to microbes, and that is overtopping the amount of carbon taken up by plants. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Answer the question. The question. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Melissa, you have okay, your mic Melissa, open. Melissa, you, you have your mic, mic open. Do you have a question you want? Oh, she's typing. <laughs> okay. I don't know if they, they have a question or everybody's just typing away there. So um, I guess we'll see. Um, so Melissa does have a question. Photosynthetic. Is the photosynthetic rate is not smelling just more CO2 being re respired? Hi, Allison. So, Melissa, do you want to ask a question so it's a little bit clearer? Go ahead. Sure. I'm um, sorry. I was just, I think, was that if that was Allison who was just talking and saying that. I just wanted to clarify that it's not that the photosynthetic rate is slowing down. Um, it's staying constant, but more soil respiration is happening. That's increasing. So that's why the tundra would become um, a source rather than a sink. I see Elizabeth shaking her head. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that, exactly. And that's something that could happen. And another thing that we're ha thinking is, and especially in Healy, all of those photos that I had up there um, were from around our field site. And you may have been able to see in the distance some spruce trees hanging out. Um, be, so one of, one of the other things that um, we're thinking is with warming, will you have a species composi composition change from a tundra ecosystem to a boreal forest ecosystem? And, um, and then what's going to happen with carbon? with that. And we're still working that out that has to do with nitrogen availability and and other things like that. So it's kind of hard to figure out what's going to happen so far in the future. Yes, at some point, you know, photosynthesis is going to reach it's going to sort of plateau and maybe you'll have uh, decomposition also increasing the whole time, but then maybe we might have a whole ecosystem shift. Um, which is why I don't think anyone is well, we're not. We don't. We just don't know. I guess what's going to happen. Okay. It looks like um, some people are already having to sign off. Thank you, Sue, for uh, joining us as well and and helping uh, respond to questions. And um, Elizabeth, thank you. And John, thank you for um, joining us today, as well as all the great questions from the. Um, and like we said, um, we'll archive this and we'll post it on the Polar Trek website as well as um, we'll post it for the CI students. So that should be up in the next couple of days if you need to uh, refresh it. And if you need to
to more questions answered, you can um, contact the presenters directly or for the CI students, there is a blog site where we have running list of questions as well that they can respond to. So again, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate that I'm happy to answer questions. Um, that uh, if you have any, send, send me an email, um, or I guess I'm on to this to, to your web platform as well. Um, but but I'm happy if you have questions that didn't get answered or you didn't think it got answered fully enough, then um, shoot me an email. All right, we will. Thank you very much, and you guys have a good day in Healy, and everybody else have a great day wherever you are. Bye.